and welcome to episode two of Best of Austin. <laughs> um, yes. I'm a little newer at this than Chris, as you can tell. No, no, he's perfect. It was awesome. <laughs> you crushed it. Okay, go. Um, so we're here across from the Paramount Theater, and let me tell you a little bit about its two ghosts. Now, before a theater was built here, back in the days of the Republic of Texas, this was the location of the War Department. And uh, it said that one woman came one day to the War Department wondering about the fate of her husband who had not returned home after the battle for independence. And she was told here at the War Department that her husband unfortunately had died and she collapsed right there it ever since. Um, now the story of the war widow, no way to verify that, but the story of the ghost, well, that we uh, have a little more actually recent evidence of because just a couple years ago a touring pianist, not a local, didn't know anything about the Paramount Theater or its ghost stories. Um, you know, he was doing his sound check in the afternoon and once the sound check was done he looked out into the beautiful open theater. It is a gorgeous theater inside there. And uh, he took a picture of the big empty auditorium. But when he looked back at that picture later, there actually was the figure of a woman in white sitting clearly in the balcony, staring down at him. So when he showed it to the theater employees, of course, they told him, we have a lady in white who haunts the theater here. Uh, but even more recently than that, in the year 2000. Um, now, one thing that the Paramount is well known for is its very popular summer classic film series. And one of the best ways for Austinites to escape the heat in the summertime, sit in a nice cool theater for a very cheap ticket price, and enjoy old classic films. Uh, now in the year 2000, their longtime projectionist, Walter Norris, he'd been working at the Paramount pretty much since they reopened in the 1970s. Uh, now he was just loading the second reel of his own favorite classic film, Casablanca, when unfortunately he suffered a heart attack. So, it's been said ever since that he is still hanging out in the projection room to this day. And of course, you can see our duck tour here. Because we've got that beautiful Colorado River running right through our city, we're a great place to do a duck tour. Oh yeah? Oh yeah. It's one of the few cities <laughs> I know where they haven't banned duck tours yet. Oh really? <laughs> there's been a, there's been a, unfortunately, I mean, oh. it's not a joking incident, but it's, oh, there's right. been a, a number of fatal uh, fatalities related to duck tours in the oh, last dear. couple of years. Well, sort of like helicopters seem safer. Whoop. Real quick here, just want to point out another cool historic building to y'all from the 1870s. Um, and this one is especially unique because it was built in that reconstruction era post-Civil War. This is the Walter Tips building. It's got this beautiful sort of neo-Renaissance style to it. But actually the support girder of this building was made from recycled shells from the Confederate Army, which just goes to show that even when you were building something great, you know, things weren't necessarily great economically. You probably still had to cut a few corners, um, make some budget choices. So that's how they built this building here, you, recycling those Confederate shells. And um, as we get to the corner here, we're going to see a great cultural institution of Austin, um, the Jones Center, which is the second smaller branch of our contemporary art museum. It's this cool glass building here that we're approaching on the corner. As we're approaching, just uh, Shannon asks, what's a duck tour? And Teague jumps in to make fun of me for <laughs> our Peabody Hotel in Memphis duck visit. Oh. Which is not the same thing. That was a duck tour where we were looking at live ducks. Oh, not, not a duck boat a tour. A literal as, duck uh, tour. Love it. Yeah. yeah, duck tours are kind of an amphibious tour vehicle. Um, so they're a boat on the river or the lake through downtown. Um, now, since we're looking over here, across the street from us is the Intercontinental Hotel, or actually, I believe it's changed ownership recently. Um, but it was the Intercontinental Hotel for a long time. This place was built in 1924. It was at one time the tallest building in Austin. And as you can see at the top, they actually added floors gradually over time to make it even taller. Um, on the second floor though, open to everyone, is the Stephen F. Austin Bar. And it's got a beautiful terrace with an amazing view of Congress Avenue and the Capitol Building. Um, but you might have noticed it shares a name with our city, Austin. Um, and Stephen F. Austin is actually the namesake of the city. Uh, he's known as the father of Texas, and that's because back in the 1820s, while Tejas was still a part of 
Mexico. He was one of those Americans recruiting people to move here, and he brought hundreds of families to settle given to the capital when it was established in 1839. But to slowly bring our view back over to this side of the street, as I mentioned, we've got the Jones Center over here. Um, now, our Contemporary Art Museum in Austin has a larger location as well. It's a beautiful estate called Laguna Gloria on the west side of town, an Italian-style villa housing our permanent art collection and our local art school. But um, by the 90s, they wanted a more central location too, a place for temporary exhibits where they could host work from artists all over the world. So they opened the Jones Center here. And uh, now they've usually got two to three different temporary exhibits featured throughout the course of the year. Um, like I said, by artists, not just from Austin, but international artists. Um, great place to come and check out some incredible contemporary art. And if you look all the way up towards the top, and once we get across the street, work of art on display up there with liberty and justice for all it says that piece was installed there a few years ago it was created by an artist named Jim Hodges and uh, I love how clever he was when titling this piece because of course it is finished but its title is with liberty and justice for all a work in progress and uh, Congress Avenue being the main street of Texas leading right up to the state capitol building. As you can imagine, it's pretty typical for marches and rallies and political events to take place here on Congress Avenue, heading right up past this uh, piece of work. So pretty relevant to our position in state politics. Jack writes. Yeah. Um, according to Wikipedia, the Goliath Massacre happened today in 1836. Oh yeah, thank you, Jack, for that bit of Texas independence history. So um, the Battle of Goliath, we briefly mentioned when we were looking at the African American History Memorial. That was a major battle in Texas in 1836. So thank you so much, Jack, for uh, telling us that today is the anniversary of that battle. And we're actually headed over here to meet a very important figure in Austin's local history. Her name is Angelina Eberly, and in fact, she is probably a big part of the reason why Austin even became the big city that it is today. Because like we've talked about, there was some debate about where the capital of the Independent Republic of Texas should be. Houston, the better established city. There are some other thrown, uh, ideas thrown into the ring as well. But Austin here was established as the capital, and as we know, it was sort of a small frontier town at the time. Now, Houston argued this was not a safe place to keep the Texas archives. All of their important legal documents, historical documents, those were stored here at the time in the General Land Office building. But one uh, thing that Houston did in his bid to move the capital to Houston was to claim that the archives should be kept in a safer location. So he actually sent some men here to, well, in the Austinites' view, steal the archives from the city. And when these men showed up at the General Land Office building and loaded up these archives after dark, Angelina realized that something was up. Now, she actually ran a boarding house nearby. Sam Houston had lived there even at one point, so I think she knew he was a little bit sneaky in getting what he wanted. And she ran right out into the street. Now, Austin being out on the frontier, they did have a cannon just kind of permanently installed in the middle of Congress Avenue, just in case they ever were attacked. And so Angelina loaded up a cannonball and shot it right over into the General Land Office building. Fortunately, nobody was injured, but that is the one shot of what we now very dramatically today call the Texas Archive War. Uh, now, the documents and the men with the cart fled right out of town, but thanks to Angelina, um, well, the Austinites were hot on their tail. They caught up just 18 miles away and managed to convince, well, rather surround the guys with the documents and get them to give them back. Uh, then they all actually returned back to Austin and had a big reconciliatory feast as the women in town had been cooking the entire time they were gone. And uh, well, we really do have Angelina to thank for that um, and for Austin remaining the capital city of Texas and growing into the city that we have today. Because, well, if in the 1840s, Houston had become the capital instead, Austin might have stayed a little frontier town. May have never have become a big metropolis like it is today. But let's head a little further down Congress Avenue. 
Um, while we're on our way there, some great local businesses across the street. We can hear some great live music going on in front of Wild About Music, which is a good place to get your music-themed souvenirs. So Teak says uh, Canon is very dramatic. Uh, and it's dramatic history. Thank you, Teague, for chiming in. Always a pleasure. And Patrick, uh, guy um, a couple hours before your tour right now uh, from the Gothic district in Barcelona, just uh, give you some applause. Oh, thank you so much, Patrick. I appreciate the applause. I'll have to go and check out your tour. Now, uh, you might have heard Austin is the live music capital of the world. Do you agree? I know that there are a lot of cities out there who might compete with us for the title. Nashville, of course, comes to mind. Um, so who decided exactly that we are the live music capital of the world? How did we get that title? Well, the truth is it was an advertising campaign in the 90s trying to bring more tourism to this growing city. And uh, they did originally consider live music capital of the universe before deciding we don't know what music is like on Mars. That's just not fair. Uh, but at least in terms of the human world, they did point out that at the time we had per capita the most live music venues of any city, about 300 in the mid 90s music venues where you could find live music playing for about half a million people who lived in town at the time. But as y'all know, we have about doubled our population since then. And even pre-COVID, we were sadly down to about 250 music venues. We've lost a handful in the last year. Um, so, you know, hopefully we'll see a lot of that music scene reviving soon. But I still think we deserve the title, even if the per capita thing isn't true anymore. Because the reality is that we have an incredible live music scene here in Austin. And not just the styles of music that you might expect to hear in Texas. A lot of people come and ask, is it just country music? Is it just blues? And of course, you'll find great places to see those styles of music here in Austin. But one thing that I think makes the Austin music scene really special is that it is very eclectic. And um, a lot of the bands here in town, you might struggle to sort of put into one genre or another, but a lot of people are combining different influences together and experimenting with new sounds. Um, so that Austin style of music is, well, very eclectic. And I definitely recommend coming here to check it out yourself or again, listen to KUTX if you're far away, uh, get a little taste of the great local music scene. And now from this corner, some of our major skyscrapers. In fact, we get kind of a history of the Austin skyscraper right here on this corner. Across from us is the Scarborough Building. This was our first Chicago-style skyscraper, finished in 1910 to house the Scarborough department store. And at eight stories tall, it was not only the tallest here in town, but anywhere between New Orleans and San Francisco. But it didn't keep that title for very long because while Mr. Scarborough's being, uh, building was being built, a very competitive banker in town, Mr. George Washington Littlefield, decided to break ground on his own building. And just to make sure his would be taller, he built an extra half story in that you can see up near the top of it where you see that bright gold Littlefield. Now at first his building was eight and a half stories tall and it had this beautiful roof garden on top. So it was one of the most luxurious places in town for people to enjoy the incredible view as they were on the top. As taller buildings were built in the city, well, Littlefield really wanted to keep his title as tallest. So he walled in that roof garden, added an extra floor to his building just to make sure he would be the tallest a little longer. Um, and actually in this building, Linda B. Johnson had one of his first government offices back in the 1930s when he was the statewide director for the National Youth Association. And he was a very hard worker even back then. He worked long hours late into the night by gas lamp because they turned the electricity off on him every night promptly at 10.30 p.m. So we're gonna continue our way down Congress Avenue here. Um, and as we do, we're gonna see a couple more uh, big skyscrapers. You might have noticed this big black building across the street from us, the Bank of America Tower. That was one of the first, what we would really consider skyscrapers, built in Austin in the uh, 1970s, early 80s. And it was around that time with some of these taller towers being built that Austinites started to become concerned about their views of the Capitol building. They wanted to make sure that even as the city grew, the Capitol grand view would still be visible from all over town. 
So in the mid 70s, the Capitol View corridors were inaugurated. And by now there are over 30 different viewpoints around town whose views of the Capitol are protected by law. So a lot of buildings around Austin that have sort of interesting shapes to them often are because they're avoiding those view corridors, avoiding blocking that view. Um, now, the shortest corridors are only a few blocks long. The longest one's about 5.7 miles all the way out to a beautiful vista in West Austin. And in fact, two and a half miles is a capital view corridor, um, which is why these days you can't build a big tall skyscraper all the way out to the edge of the street. But instead, there are a lot of height restrictions and setbacks that uh, buildings are required to abide by to ensure that those views are kept clear. T gas is really quick. Uh, Austin Mahoney. Hmm? Austin Mahone, Mahoney. Let me see. Originally from Texas, but it's been in Miami for a long time. Any chance that that Austin is from this Austin? Oh, um, you know, I'm not familiar with them. So, not sure about that one. But I want to direct your view across the street again to some really cool murals over on the side of the Mexicarte Museum. Now that museum first was established in the mid 80s in what used to be Austin's warehouse district, right along the Colorado River. Moved here uh, downtown to Congress Avenue a few years later. We uh, we're going to cross this way actually, we'll stay on the side of the street. But the Mexicarte Museum is one of the few in the country that really focuses on celebrating and educating about the Mexican that Mexican heritage and history as well. So those murals get switched out pretty often. Um, you'll see a lot of them, um, a lot of artists who, um, both from Austin and coming from other cities around the world, come and uh, represent their work there. But the museum itself also holds prints, sculptures, paintings, uh, ceremonial masks, all kinds of incredible art, and um, have a lot of education outreach programs as well. So, very cool place. And next door, we'll get a good look up at one of Austin's most iconic skyscrapers. Kind of kicked off the um, current round of our more contemporary, newer tall buildings in Austin. Um, now, this is the Frost Bank headquarters, and it was actually the first skyscraper to break ground in the US after 9 11. Um, so, it holds significance. It's also been one of the most beautiful in the Austin skyline for a long time, although there's actually kind of a funny rumor and myth about the building itself. Uh, now, a lot of people say that the top actually looks like an owl's face. And some people think that the architect designed it to reflect the mascot of Rice University, um, where he supposedly went to school. And that's in Houston. So um, a lot of people think that he did that as sort of a jab at Austin. Um, but even though it's kind of a great story, it's also not true. Uh, in fact, the architecture firm who designed this building had nothing to do with Texas at all um, or Rice University. So not sure where that story came from, but you'll likely hear locals repeating it around town. And actually this building behind us, to turn around here real quick, has some interesting history of its own. Now houses um, a bar called Speakeasy, but back in 1916, this was the home of the Southwestern Telephone and Telegraph Company, and a fire broke out in July that year. Uh, now, the phones were ringing off the hook with people calling in to report the fire or ask about the fire, and so the poor telephone operators actually stayed at their posts while the building burnt and only managed to safely evacuate just three minutes before some of the walls collapsed in on themselves. Um, so the version that we see here today is kind of a rebuilt version of the old Chrysler building from the late 19th century. But it's one of the main places in town where you can catch live music. Oh, I'm sure it does, yeah. <laughs> That smell of old beer and air conditioning. Oh, that delicious smell. Yeah. Now, what's going on over here? Oh, yeah, we've got a pub crawler. Austin's a big party city. You know, we've got a big nightlife and entertainment scene here. And uh, in the last couple years, I have heard that we've actually stolen the title of Bachelor and Bachelorette Party Capital of the Country. Previously was Nashville. 
but apparently we have overtaken them as the most popular location. Congratulations. <laughs> so that's a pretty common sight around town these days. And I'm going to wearing that that is indeed a bachelorette party. I was impressed that half of them were on their phones at the same time. <laughs> yeah, you know, luckily they don't have to steer that thing. They just have to pedal. And drink. And drink, of course. And sing. They actually make them sing a lot of the time. Do you sing? I actually am a singer. Um, oh. Historically, that is my, my trade, you might say. Um, I actually attended Berklee College of Music in Boston and then ended up living in Paris for a year and a half, which is actually where I first worked as a tour guide. Um, so I moved to Paris after college and really randomly saw an ad looking for English speakers to guide tours. And I'd always, you know, music had always been my primary passion, but I've always loved history and culture. Luckily grew up in a family that loved traveling and thought that sounded like a lot of fun. Um, so about a year and a half, I was a tour guide in Paris. I got to do the Louvre, the Eiffel Tower, Notre Dame, all the main sites. Um, had an incredible time, but then moved to Austin. Uh, came here for grad school, back to studying music, and um, sort of let that go. But eventually when I ended up deciding to stay in Austin and leave academia, I wanted to get back into tour guiding and now show people the city that I've really adopted as my permanent home. Um, so even though I'm not a born and raised Austinite, I'd like to think that I've uh, legitimated myself hopefully here um, by learning enough about Austin that even my born and raised Austinite fiance says that I know more than he does. <laughs> now, um, yeah. Sterling says, Austin Mahone, to answer Teak's question. Oh, to yeah. Teak's question, Sterling. Uh, I have to talk to you, Mike. Sterling says uh, that, um, uh, that Austin Mahone is from San Antonio, Texas. Oh, yeah. Whoever, it's a music. Music, music at a very important location. Now, across the street, you can see that little tan two-story building. Um, that's the home of the Elephant Room. Down in the basement underground there, it's Austin's premier jazz club since 1990. One, uh, but it, there's a fun story behind its name too, the Elephant Room, because in the mid 80s, this big office tower was being built right behind it here. And in excavating to uh, build the foundation for that building, they actually uncovered some woolly mammoth bones deep underground. Um, nobody had really known before that woolly mammoths had inhabited this area, so it was a very surprising find. You can now see those bones on display on campus in the Natural History Museum. But when the elephant room opened a few years later, they thought, well, hey, the elephants were down here hanging out underground, and we will be too in the basement of this building. So let's call it the elephant room. But another very important location to turn around here, Patagonia. I'm just kidding. Patagonia is great. But this building is actually one of the most important in Austin's music history. Now, back in the 1960s, Austin was a much smaller college town, uh, but a lot of young students were arriving in town at the time and as you can imagine being the 1960s a lot of them were sort of hippies um, and when they got here there just were not many places for them to go see the kinds of music that they wanted or for those starting bands themselves psychedelic rock um, things like that no venue in town was going to book that kind of thing in what was still a more conservative smaller town at the time so in the fall of 1967 a group of students rented out this building for just 350 dollars a month at the time, as we've talked about, these older buildings were considered pretty undesirable. And we're getting some waves here from the staff inside Patagonia. I miss y'all. Normally on a live tour, we would actually go inside because they have some really cool posters and artifacts on display from the days as a music venue. So hi, it's so good Thanks. to see you. Thanks your air conditioning. Yeah. You can feel it. That's another feel plus it. of going inside for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, 1967 group of students opened here, the Vulcan Gas Company. This was Austin's really first eclectic music venue. They also had the first light show in town. Um, but for those psychedelic rock bands like the 13th Floor Elevators, who went on to influence a lot of other psych bands of the late 60s and 70s, and bands like Shiva's Headband, who were the first rock band in Austin to win a major recording contract. They were the house band here at the Vulcan Gas Company. They played pretty much every night. A really cool sort of psychedelic country band. So like we talked about earlier, putting two things together that you wouldn't necessarily think would go. Um, but this was really an amazing creative place, not only for musicians, but there was also the Armadillo Art Squad based here, making all the posters for the show and all other kinds of art. And they actually really started to attract a broader diversity of artists to Austin. 
which again was a pretty small town still. Um, it really put Austin sort of on the musical map, so to speak, for more eclectic artists who like the Velvet Underground and um, Captain Beefheart, who never really would have come to Austin before. Now all of a sudden we're attracted to play here at this cool place, the Vulcan Gas Company. Um, now the venue only lasted for about three years. They sold their tickets super cheap because it was a student run venue. They didn't have a liquor license. So eventually the rent caught up with them and they had to shut down. But luckily Shiva's headband had just won their big recording contract, gotten their first royalty check. And so they helped with funding to start up a new venue, the Armadillo World Headquarters, which was not here downtown, but South Austin. And then over the course of the 70s, that was really sort of the headquarters literally, of Austin's eclectic live music scene. It's where Willie Nelson played his first local show when he moved here to town in 1972. And many people name it as the place that birthed the Austin sound of music and the eclectic live music scene that we still have here today. Um, but of course, one important musician in Austin history is Miss Janis Joplin. Uh, now, Janis was originally from a very small town on the coast of Texas. I hope we have some Janis Joplin fans out there. Put your favorite Janis song into the comments if you have one, um, so that if there is anybody who's not familiar, they can, you know, go and check her out. As y'all know, she was an incredibly unique performer and personality. And in the very small coastal Texas town of Port Arthur, she did not fit in very well. So as a teenager, um, at the age of 19, she came here to Austin in 1962 and enrolled at UT to study actually visual art. But, uh, you know, she's actually started her music career here as well at a very famous venue called Threadgills. It was one of the longest running venues in Austin. It did unfortunately permanently close. It leaves an incredible legacy behind, including being the place where Janis Joplin played many of her first gigs. And in fact, I want to give a special shout out to Threadgills too because my fiance Sterling, the saxophone player y'all have heard about so far, well, his mom is actually a Threadgill. She grew up performing with the Threadgill family band, her and her eight siblings touring all over the state of Texas. So if you ask a Texan, the Threadgill family name is definitely one that goes along with music. Um, and Kenny Threadgill was the one who ran Threadgills. Now, Threadgills itself had actually been a gas station back in the early 1930s. Kenny sold booze under the counter during Prohibition was the first one in town to get a beer sales license when that ended, and so turned his gas station into a bar and for decades hosted some of the best jams, musical gatherings. Um, so it was an incredible place for musicians to come together. And he himself was also a great singer-songwriter of country music. Um, but even though Janice was a lot younger when she showed up in Austin in the friends, and actually one of the last performances she gave just three months before her death in 1970, she canceled a show in Hawaii at the last minute that was gonna pay her $15,000. And instead, she flew home to Austin and surprised Kenny at his birthday party, which was a big picnic, which attracted thousands of people every year. And she came here to sing a song on stage with him. Now across the street from us right now, I wanna point out a cool little spot it's kind of hidden from view, actually. We're going to cross over there to get a closer look. But, um, yeah. What, what, what are some, what's like the most famous song by the... Oh, by Janis Joplin? No, by the Hills. Oh, you know, I can't think of one off the top of my head. I honestly haven't listened to a lot of Kenny Threadgill's music myself. <laughs> um, but one thing he was especially known for, um, he had actually met Jimmy Rogers at one point as a young man, another very famous country singer who y'all might know, was especially known for his yodeling skills. And um, Jimmy Rogers did actually teach Kenny Threadgill how to yodel. So that was also something that he incorporated into a lot of his performances. Jack shouts out Turtle Blues as being one of Oh, thanks favorite. Jack, yeah. And Michaela uh, says she was born one year after John Chaplin's death. Oh, wow. Definitely yeah. giving away Michaela's age. <laughs> Thanks for being so upfront with us, Michaela. We appreciate your honesty and your contributions. And we're passing right now a great little spot. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you know, Austin's really grown into sort of a foodie city um, as it's gotten bigger. We're known for our music and our street art. And um, 
that kind of thing. But we're also these days really becoming more known for our food scene too. But you definitely don't have to drop a lot of money to eat some good food here in Austin. Of course, we've got tons of food trucks, tacos to be found everywhere. Uh, but this is actually a really cool spot here that opened up just a few years ago. And it's actually a little sort of food court market style place um, in the basement of one of Austin's um, office buildings here right downtown. It's called the Fairground, but F-A-R-E, like food, fair, uh, the Fairground. And it actually features down in the basement there a bunch of stalls from some of Austin's most popular restaurants. So it's a great place when you are here in town exploring downtown Congress Avenue. Grab a quick break here at the fairground and all in one go you can try little things, um, small plates from a whole bunch of different popular Austin restaurants. You can enjoy our beautiful weather with a little picnic out here on this big lawn. So definitely recommend checking that out when you're in town. And uh, we're gonna wrap up in just a minute here, but before we do, I wanna take y'all just here to the end of Congress Avenue downtown. Um, but actually, there's a lot more of Congress Avenue once you get into South Austin. And the neighborhood of South Congress is definitely one of the hippest these days around town. You'll find a lot of cool little boutiques, shops, restaurants on that part of Congress Avenue. Uh, we're not going to head down there ourselves because it's a little bit of a walk from here. But I just wanted to let you all know when you do come to Austin, you'll definitely want to go wander through the South Congress neighborhood and check that out. I want to point out one other good place to grab food here as well, which is Vera Cruz All Natural. They've got a convenient little window on the side of the Line Hotel here. It's definitely one of the best little taco places in town, especially if you're looking for more authentic Mexican style tacos. Um, because to me, there's sort of a spectrum of tacos in Austin. You've got the more authentic Mexican style, and then you've got what I like to call hipster tacos. And um, <laughs> those are really exemplified by places like Torchies, um, which is a local. Um, we've got Torchies now even outside of Austin, and their tacos are also great, um, but they're a little less traditional to the Mexican style. Um, but no matter what kind of tacos you like, and I do recommend if you come to Austin, you try a wide variety, but you'll find it all here. And uh, now we are here on the Congress Avenue Bridge. We're just going to make one more cross of the street before we wrap up. Uh, but I want to make sure that y'all get a view of our beautiful lake slash river. Uh, this is one thing that a lot of people ask about. Is the body of water in the middle of Austin a river or a lake? Uh, the answer is it's both. Like I mentioned before, it is a part of the Colorado River. Again, not the big Colorado River, the smaller Colorado River. And, um, but here, because it's dammed up, it also has formed a man-made lake. Debatable title itself. Um, now, historically, this lake was called Town Lake. You know, a good, simple name. But Lady Bird, Lady Bird Johnson, that is, of course, former First Lady of Texas. Like I mentioned much earlier on in the tour, she uh, really was passionate about beautifying the city and the state. And one of her projects in the 1970s was to basically initiate a massive cleanup of the banks of the river, the lake here, and to turn it into a more beautiful destination, a place where locals could really come and enjoy themselves. And uh, so after that, a lot of locals thought that they should rename the lake in honor of Lady Bird, call it Lady Bird Lake. But she was not a fan of that idea. She really wanted it to be Town Lake, as it has always been. But as soon as she passed away in 2007, it only took the city about a month to rename the lake after her, even against her own wishes. So these days, depending on who you ask, this is either Town Lake or Lady Bird Lake. But there are lots of ways that you can enjoy the lake. You'll see some swan boats out there, kayaks, it's a great place to catch a view of the bats. As y'all might know, we are known as the Bat City. And that's because underneath this bridge, the Congress Avenue Bridge, we have the largest urban bat colony in North America. Uh, they are a colony of Mexican free-tail bats who migrate up here from Mexico every spring. They've just arrived over the course of the last month or so. And actually, the approximately 
750,000 bats that we have under the bridge right now are pretty much all going to be mothers pretty soon. This is a maternal bat colony. So by the end of this summer, we'll have close to a million and a half bats here in Austin because each one of those mothers will have a cute little baby bat with her by that time. Um, so over the course of the summer, and especially because it later on in the summer, it's a very popular thing to do to come around right at sunset and see the incredible swarm of bats head out on their nightly hunt over Ladybird Lake. So I just wanted to wrap up here with this beautiful view for y'all. The sun is coming out in Austin, Texas. It is heating up. And I hope that you guys had a really great time today. So again, drop us in the comments. What is the one thing that you want to come and visit Austin? I'm very curious to hear. And I hope that y'all did have a great time today. Um, now, as you know, I am with Tipster. We are the first and only tip-based tour company in Austin. Again, I'm Laura. And I hope that you guys had as much fun as I did today. I know this was a new experience for me, a very different way of doing a tour. Um, but I hope that you guys along for the ride had a great time. I know I did. And um, if you do want to show your appreciation, we've got our donation links in the description. Um, again, I do this because I love it. I want to show y'all a great time. Um, but I want to make sure that you also get a chance to show your appreciation. Um, so if you do want to do that, of course, totally up to you. Throw your donation in there. Throw your comments in the chat as well. And um, if there are any last questions, I can go ahead and answer those. But um, otherwise, I will say farewell to y'all. But I'll hang out for another minute if you guys are hanging, if you have any questions for me to answer. They're like 45 seconds, 30 to 45 seconds behind us. Oh, gotcha. Right to catch it totally and then when they text us it'll take two seconds for it to show back up okay well while we're waiting for any last questions we're gonna spin our view one more time around this way mm. and check out a really cool new mural that was just painted a few months ago here okay, in you, town I'll let you get to watch as well when people are saying thank you oh, so yeah. you can see them coming in thanks so much y'all for joining us so much fun to get to hang out with you guys all over the world today Shannon says thanks uh, to our, um, uh, we've got Ross, uh, who's, uh, Ross and Nikki who are both watching but not together. Um, thank you guys. Thanks Kristen, uh, thanks Kristen. Diana. Diana, amazing, thank you. And Michaela, thanks so much for your questions. Yeah, mom, thanks, thanks for mom. watching. <laughs> There's Nikki, thank you Teague, really appreciate it. Um, you guys know if you, if you really, thank you uh, Michaela, um, if you guys want, sharing the video even as a video after it's done with the live helps a lot to let laura and tipster uh, reach more people so that way when they're coming to austin they'll be able to come on this awesome tour where are you guys up and running again right now i mean can people come to austin right now and join a tour with you yeah great question so um in the past year we've been offering private tours only uh, they are just 15 dollars a person because it is still very important to us to make sure that they are affordable and accessible to and schedule a private tour with us but we are hoping to get some public tours back up and running in the uh, last of our spring season here so check out our website tipster tipstertours.com tipstertours.com in the comments oh yeah uh, we've got uh, that uh, link got, me, in the in the description of the video there's a link uh, underneath your name great you can also of course find us on facebook and instagram um, but our website is where you'll find the schedule of tours and where as soon as we've got those public tours up and running again you'll see info on that um, so typically we do offer a downtown tour that's a little bit of what we talked about today um, a little bit different though too so if you do come to town you will definitely still get some different info different stories out of that tour but we also have a music tour of course being the live music capital of the world um, and that's mostly about kind of the music history as well as the present of Austin so you'll hear a lot more great stories of our music culture music scene different types of music different places to go to listen to music uh, we also have a really fun east side art tour so over in the very hip neighborhood of East Austin we'll find a lot more cool kinds and that is constantly changing and growing as well so a really cool place to see some of that very uh, lively street art scene here in Austin and then we also have a haunts and horrors tour so if you are one of those ghost story fans and you want to hear a little bit more about the sinister side of Austin history um, that's definitely the one for you what do you guys say? Should we try to get Laura to give us a ghost tour uh, for our next live stream? Should we come back and do an evening Austin tour uh, with some ghost action? If we don't get some comments saying ghost tour with Laura, you know, who knows what's <laughs> going to happen, right? 
I would love to do a ghost tour for y'all. There are a lot of great stories that we didn't get to today in terms of the ghostly side of Austin. Um, and again, we kind of can pick apart some of the urban legends too, see what the real history is behind some of those ghost stories. And says yes to ghost tour. Yes, Shannon, I will see you on the ghost tour. Um, but you know, there are also some great lesser known stories that haven't turned into um, so even the ghosts that you'll hear about from most Austinites, they're leaving some of the good stuff out. Says yes to the ghost tour. Ghost tour is the one. <laughs> All right, ghost tour. tour is the way uh, to go. We don't so know what we're doing. we will see y'all again soon for a ghost tour. Um, but for now, we'll sign off. Say farewell to everyone again. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope to see you soon. Let's. I'm gonna let. I, it's one of my few things.